All right. Have you ever gone out thinking the first few minutes of a race, geez, I had my plan, but today might be my day, only to hit the last quarter of the race running about a minute or so per K or per mile slower than you uh, anticipated or planned? Uh, yes, we all have. We've all bonked or blown up, hit the wall. So it's just the nature of it. And I'll tell you why, and I'll tell you how you can get faster next time. Colloquially, you started too hard, bro. We've all done it. So why does pacing matter? So as humans, we can only exercise at high workloads for short durations. I'll get into what high workloads mean, but the higher the workload, the shorter duration we can last. We can't sprint forever. You know that. I know that. My, uh, my two and a half year old son has definitely experienced that. So typically as scientists, running coaches, what we're going to use is our anaerobic or lactate threshold as the benchmark of, is for what is sustainable for about an hour. So how far and how long you can exercise above your lactate or anaerobic threshold is referred to as your anaerobic work capacity. And regardless of whether you're an elite runner or a mid-pack marathoner, your anaerobic work capacity is limited. Like I said, you can't sprint forever. Nor can you run at 5k pace for a marathon. So it doesn't matter what your personal threshold is, whether it's three minutes per K, six minutes per mile, or seven minute Ks, your time above that threshold is limited. So fatigue as a concept in, in the human body is really complicated. Numerous factors can come into us uh, slowing down on any particular day. Neuromuscular capacity, core temperature, hydration status, course terrain. Um, there are a lot of factors that can influence us in our ability to exert uh, muscular force, metabolic power, whatever. But for now, I'm just I'm going to stick to the scope of this chat of metabolism and fuel utilization. So that's carbs, carbohydrate, and lactate predominantly. You know, everyone loves a good chat about carbs. So once we work, start running above our aerobic threshold, so not not anaerobic, aerobic threshold. So it's kind of like, can be referred to as different things, uh, lactate threshold one, maybe fat max, like maximal fat oxidation uh, rate. Once we begin to exercise above that intensity, we start to burn carbohydrates. And so this would typically be somewhere in zone two for a lot of people, upper end of zone two. If you're on more of a, you know, a carbohydrate restricted diet or you do a lot of fasted running, maybe it's the bottom end of zone three, around 90% of your threshold. But it'll be 85, 90% of your threshold. Uh, some people, it's going to be, yeah, anywhere from 80 to 90%. If you said that, that's definitely going to be your range of your threshold. Um, so once we start burning carbohydrates, we start accumulating the byproducts of carbohydrate or glycolytic metabolism, namely lactate and hydrogen ions. Okay, Dr. Will, you've lost me. <laughs> I hear that a lot, right? So I'll just, I'll try and recap a little bit of exercising metabolism 101. That is, lactate can only come from carbohydrates. There it is, okay? So you've got carbohydrates, they're the only fuel source that can produce lactate. And then carbohydrates can be oxidized or metabolized in the presence and absence of oxygen. So in the presence of oxygen aerobically and in the absence of oxygen anaerobically. So this is what makes carbohydrates such a powerful fuel. Fats, proteins, ketones, they can only be metabolized uh, in the presence of oxygen. So aerobically. And this makes them slow because they need to, they're longer, they're more complex molecules, not so much ketones, but they have to be broken down and transferred through beta oxidation and the TCA Krebs cycle, if anyone remembers that, uh, which electron transport chain. So it's like this really long, complicated process that requires oxygen, oxygen transport, and 
it therefore is slow. It's a slow way to produce ATP, the energy currency of the cell. So whereas carbohydrates, we can, you know, if we're jogging along, cool, we can burn carbs and use oxygen. Way more efficient, really good, uh, not creating any, you know, real negative uh, byproducts. But as we start to ex increase our exercise intensity or our workload, our energy requirements speed up. We know that we're doing more work to run faster. So to sustain and supply the energy that the working muscles need, we need to use more carbohydrates. And at times we're going to need to use more carbohydrates quickly so we use less fats. And also we won't be able to transport oxygen in time. So we'll do a lot of this uh, metabolic work anaerobically, which is generating lactate and the associated hydrogen ions. Uh, all right, Will, I'm still with you slightly. Okay, so this leads into the carbohydrate conundrum. So the problem with using more carbohydrates and fewer fats as we speed up is that we have a limited amount of carbohydrates and a near unlimited amount of fats, relatively speaking. So like I've got a body fat of around 10%, I weigh 75 kgs, I have 7.5 kgs of fat, so that is what, 7,500 grams, and I get 9 calories per gram from fats, uh, so that is a heap, that is a heap of energy, what is that, like 63,000 calories or something, and it takes me around 3,000 calories to run a marathon, and maybe in 10 to 15 thousands to run an uh, ultra marathon. Uh, so needless to say, I have, a, as a pretty lean guy, I have more than enough fats to sustain working, you know, running in zone two for a few days. So what's annoying about that is, well, actually, if I want to start running at marathon pace, I'm going to need carbohydrates because my energy requirements speed up above what fats can provide. So I need to use carbs. And it's so annoying because carbs are limited. Depending on the size of your muscles, your training status, your diet, you're going to store around 300 to 500 grams of carbohydrates on your body. And at four calories per gram, that's not much. That's only 1,500 to 2,000. And that is less than what I can run a marathon in and I'm running at marathon two hours 30, two hours 40. So if you're running, you know, three hours, you're going to be expending more energy. If you weigh more than me, you'll be expending more energy. If you weigh less than me, you'll be expending less energy, but you probably won't be able to store as much carbohydrate. But regardless, the fact is, I don't have enough carbohydrates to get me through the marathon solely on using carbohydrates. So therefore, if when our carbohydrates run out, we've own, we'll be left with just our slow fats. And what is this? This is when you've hit the wall, bonked, blown up, burnt your biscuit, and ruined your race. So this is what happens if we start a little too hard. We burn through our limited carbohydrate stores before the end of the race, and then we're left relying on our fats, which is slow, which is so annoying. So... What we need to do is, one, we need to supplement with carbohydrates, which I won't get into uh, in this chat, but what we need to do is pace appropriately so that we can consistently burn our carbohydrates at a rate that will not have us running out before the end of the race. And this is not the only issue with carbohydrates. Our limited carbohydrates uh, is one thing, but the byproducts of anaerobic Carbohydrate metabolism, lactate and the associated hydrogen ions are also a big problem. And you're like, yeah, I know that. Lactate, right? The burning sensation. Not quite. And this is like, I feel bad for, for lactate because it gets blamed for a lot of people's sore legs and shitty races when actually lactate isn't the cause of you blowing up. It's more like the messenger of unsustainable work. Like, hey, you're going too hard. 
slow down. That's, that's what lactate's saying, because it's the unfortunate situation for lactate that it's always there when you go above your threshold. So it makes it a great marker, and it makes sense that it would be the first thing you'd blame, kind of like, you know, that mate who convinces you to have another drink or 10, and then, you know, you can't blame them for your hangover. That's lactate, because lactate doesn't exist as a lactic acid in the muscle. Instead, its reaction colleague, hydrogen ions, is the real acid. And it's the H+, the hydrogen ions, that is the culprit of the burning sensation in your legs. And it's actual fact that lactate can be metabolized back into a usable form of energy, like carbohydrates in uh, nearby um, more fatigue-resistant aerobic muscle fibers. And so it's actually helping the very muscles it's blamed for harming. Oh, the irony, poor lactate, right? Hydrogen ions, the acidity, that's the issue causing the burning sensation, which just so happens to be an associated byproduct of anaerobic metabolism. Okay, I hope, I'm, I hope you're still with me. <laughs> So how, all right, well, there's a lot of science, but how, how can you help, how can this help me go faster next time? All right, so let's recap. The faster you run, the more carbohydrates you use as fuel. Carbohydrates are limited when, they are, when we've used them up. They're gone, right? And we have two important thresholds. We have the aerobic threshold and the anaerobic threshold. Typically, the aerobic threshold is going to be that crest between zone two and zone three. But again, it will depend on your training status and whatnot. But we can typically use that 85 to 90% threshold mark as your aerobic threshold. Your anaerobic threshold is 100% of your, of your threshold. It's, it is your threshold. So the first thing we need to do to run faster in our next event is we need to know what our thresholds are. So we can use them to set our training zones that we can then utilize for pacing because they're going to influence or I guess refer to and act as a proxy for what kind of fuels we're using. So the easiest way to find your anaerobic threshold is to go run hard for one hour. Yeah, no one wants to do that. So the next easiest way is to use some of your past running data. So simplistically, like what we want to do is find our kind of best, like our one hour sustainable pace. There or thereabouts, 40 to 60 minutes. So if we're looking at our threshold pace, running pace, we'll take the best average pace that we've held for around 40 to 60 minutes. So for a lot of people, that's going to be, around a 10k or even if you take the best you know your peak 60 minute from a half marathon that's going to give you a great starting point and then you can work backwards from there uh your threshold heart rate take the last 20 minutes from a, a 10k or a half marathon so these should be all done within the last six months so it's a good representation of where you're at now and then for running power uh i have a the the willow test which is 1k all out wait a couple of days two or three days and then do a 5k time trial time is pretty much redundant um it doesn't really uh mean much because we're just looking at power output and that creates a critical power curve and we can get your threshold power running power from that then uh you can work out your your training zones i have a whole podcast on uh training zones for runners let's make it simple so go back and uh, listen to that for all the percentages and everything. And then you can download my thresholds and training zones calculator, uh, which will give you pace, heart rate, power. I'll give you all the zones. You just input your, your numbers, and uh, that's free to download. So make sure you check that out. So once you've got your training zones sorted, you can start to use your zones as intensity guides for pacing your races and training. So if you start a marathon above zone three, so if you start 
at half marathon pace, you'll burn too much carbohydrate, and in the end, you'll end up working. You'll also be accumulating lactate, and so you'll start to lose muscle function. Likewise, you can't expect to run your best 5K by starting at like 120% of your threshold. You'll just blow. You'll get the, uh, the acidity in your muscles will be far too high for you to be able to sustain muscular contractions, and you'll be cooked. You'll be forced to slow down, right? So what we can do is look at the zone guides that I have for your chosen running distance and then do some test runs of half your event distance at the bottom end of my training zone references. So I have a picture of this uh, in the in my blog that's associated with this podcast and it'll also be sent out um, with the email. So make sure you jump on my email list via my website or um, just through Instagram. So then if you can complete those test runs, so you're doing half your event distance at the bottom end uh, of the my zone references, if you can do those, and you can do those reasonably well, like obviously it's going to be uncomfortable, but if it's not like excruciating, because it's only half the distance, remember, then you can begin to test longer runs at higher intensities. So just as an example, a typical marathon is going to be done in zone three, around 90 to 95% of your threshold. Again, this is just typical, you know, as an example. So what I'd say is can go run 20Ks at... 90% of your threshold. If that's all good and your heart rate isn't reaching, you know, 180 or some crazy number and you're not bent over after it, then that's a good starting point. That is a good reference point for what you'll be able to do on race day. And then in subsequent training, you could step that up to a 30K at 93%, see how that goes, 25K. You can manipulate all of that. Um, and so that's actually what I work in and a lot of my coaching, you know, that's the kind of advice that I give um, to work with you so that you can execute the best race and best training for the optimal outcome. So make sure you check out uh, my Instagram and my Strava and, um, you know, get in touch if you need some help. Uh, I've got the the Reignite Your Running course, which helps actually just work you through all of the stuff by yourself, heaps of resources. So just check those out. All the links are in the description. And, uh, yeah, I look forward to hearing how it goes. Share this out, really helps um, me get the message out to more runners. And then flick me uh, at Dr. Willow Connor on Instagram. All right, till next time, guys. Happy running. Hey, teams, thanks for listening. If you're looking to get more tips, tricks, and advice from me, make sure you follow me on Instagram at Dr. Willow Connor and share like, review, give some stars for the episode. It really helps me get the word out and I hugely appreciate it. If you do so, give me a tag on Instagram. I'll be sure to share your stories and reach out via the DMs. All right, until next time, guys. Have a good one.